three. All right, so let's see so you guys ready? Yeah. Or do you want a couple minutes to All right, so let, let's uh, let's begin. And today we're gonna do. Oh, we're gonna do. Oh, we're gonna do the right heart. We're gonna do the right heart today, and as I explained to you guys, the right heart is very important, extremely important. Uh, we used to neglect the right heart. We used to neglect the right heart, and as a result, we pay for it in terms of not treating our patient properly. Um, I remember when I was when I started my cardiology fellowship. If something went wrong with the tricuspid valve, they said just leave it. it. It's it does it's not important. You know, if the if the cords rupture, they said just leave it. When you leave it, and if you follow that patient long enough, then they develop irreversible right heart failure. And we realized that wasn't a very good thing to do. So right heart is very important. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at the right ventricular size and function, just like we did the, the left side. Okay. We're going to look at the right atrial size, look at the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, uh, and the inferior vena cava. So those are the, the topics that we're going to cover on the right heart in detail. All right. So the right ventricle, um, you know, the, the interventricular septum separates the, the left ventricle from the right ventricle. And you, you have to know how to identify the right side or the right ventricle. Remember and a couple of things that you can use, the moderator band, the fact that the tricuspid valve is inserted lower into the ventricle than the mitral valve. Um, the wall tends to be thinner, you know, so those are some of the things they can use. All right, so the tricuspid valve, uh, the, the, the right ventricle receives blood from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve. That's just telling you where it is. And, uh, so the uh, disease affecting the right ventricle, right ventricle infarct, it's a heart attack, a heart attack invo involving the right ventricle. Cardiomyopathy, that's a heart muscle disease involving the right ventricle. Pulmonary hypertension, so if there's increased pressure in the pulmonary system, it's going to back up into the right ventricle and cause problem with the right ventricle. Uh, left to right shunt, and why we say left to right shunt is because if you have blood flowing from say the left atrium to the right atrium across the interatrial septum, or even from the left ventricle to the right ventricle across the ventricular septum, over time you have increased blood flow into the right side of the heart. Increased blood flow into the right side of the heart, increase pulmonary blood flow in the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. And that in itself caused damage to the pulmonary arterial system and caused pulmonary hypertension. So these shunts, if they're large enough, can result in pulmonary hypertension. That's a bad actor, very, very bad actor. So you want to, if someone has a shunt, you have to follow them carefully. Make sure that there's no increase or significant increase in the pulmonary circuit, the pulmonary arterial system, which, as I mentioned before, can damage the pulmonary arterial system, give rise to pulmonary hypertension. So you know, now you're going to have a resistance of blood flowing through the pulmonary circuit from the right side. Very, very important. And we're going to discuss those in a, in a little bit more detail. And then something we call arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. With arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, the right heart or the right ventricle is replaced by fatty tissue. So instead of having heart muscle, you have fatty tissue.
So instead of having instead of having hard muscle, the muscle is replaced by fatty tissue. Fatty tissue does not contract. Fatty tissue does not conduct uh, electrical impulse. So just imagine the problem. These patients are prone to arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, and death. So the right ventricle is, is subjected to a specific condition. And if you know how these conditions affect the right ventricle, then you can, you can treat the patient um, appropriately. Um, so the echo findings that best differentiate the right ventricle from the left ventricle, we, we mentioned some of them before, the more apical insertion of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So it's lower, it's lower in the, the ventricle. So that's, that's, one, that's one of the best ways to distinguish left from right side. The right side, the tricuspid valve is going to be positioned lower into the, um, it's going to be positioned lower into the ventricle. And that will tell you that's the right side. Okay? And the presence of a moderator band. So remember, you're going to see the moderator band best in the five chamber, as we pointed out during our, um, our reading session. So if in the five chamber view, you'll see the moderator band comes in. Okay? The presence of three or more papillary muscles. Remember, uh, on the left side, you have two papillary muscles, the posterior medial, anterior lateral. On the right side, you might have three or more. Um, the tri-leaflet configuration of the tricuspid valve and the septal papillar muscle attachment. So we know the mitral valve has two leaflets, anterior, posterior. The tricuspid have three, septal, anterior, posterior. Remember, we, you can identify the posterior leaflet in the RV inflow view, okay? And then, you know, in the four chamber view, we have the septal and the anterior. Um, okay? Uh, and the presence of coarse trabeculation. So the right side has this coarse trabeculation. So you should try and look for these things when you're doing the study to try to, to identify the left and the right side. And it's very important when, when, we, when we're doing congenitals because you, as I said, the heart doesn't come labeled. So some, someone who has congenital heart, you have to decide, is this the right side, is this the left side, and then you can sort of figure out what's going on and, and, and make the diagnosis of the congenital abnormality. All right, so, so these are, this is uh, some of the dimensions we use in the right ventricle, and this is a four-chamber view, as you can see. Um, so this is a four-chamber view. This is the left ventricle, the mitral valve, the left atrium, the interatrial septum, the right atrium, and the right ventricle. Now, when we're doing the apical four-chamber view to look at the right ventricle, we have to do a right ventricular uh, uh, view. We have to do a view that brings out the right ventricle. So it's a little modified view from the, um, the, 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 the normal apical four-chamber view. So it, 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 um, we usually call it a, a right ventricular uh, focus view, okay? Uh, now, there are a number of measurements. You can see we can measure the annulus from one leaflet to the next, from the medial annulus to the lateral annulus, and we call that um, the the basal uh, measurement. So you're going to do that, the, the annulus. This is a very important measure, okay? And that's um, our basal measurement. We can also get a minor uh, measurement in the mid cavity, right? 
okay? So you get a, a measurement in the mid cavity, and then we get a longitudinal from the apex down to this uh, line we, uh, um, we draw from the, 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 the lateral annulus to the medial annulus. So we have the longitudinal dimensions, and then we have the, 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 the basal uh, dimension here, and then the mid cavity dimension. Um, so this is a, what we call the RV focus view. It's an apical four chamber view, but we manipulate the probe a little bit, and the, the, the technicians will go over this with you. It's it's a uh, the view is modified somewhat to focus more on the right ventricle. The important uh, measurement here is the longitudinal measurement from the apex down to the um, this uh, this plane, which is uh, from the lateral annulus to the medial annulus, and then this this dimension at the base and the mid cavity. The base measurement is uh, much much more important. So try and see if you can get that concept because it's important to, to, to do these RV measurements. All right. Now, so we'll show you how to do these RV focus um, measurements. And you're going to measure from the end. It's an end diastolic measurement. Okay? Right ventricle focus apical four chamber view. So you say it's a right ventricle focus apical four chamber view. So it's not your standard apical four. You're going to manipulate the probe to see more of the right side, more of the RV. Okay? And if the, the measurements at the base, if it's more than 4.2 centimeters, it's dilated. So from one, from the, the lateral annulus to the medial annulus, if that dimension is more than 4.2 centimeters, it's dilated. At the mid-level, remember where you have that, if, that is, if that's more than 3.5 centimeters, then you have what we call right ventricular dilatation, or the RV is enlarged. Um, the longitudinal dimension, that's from the apex down to the base, that's, if it's greater than 8.6 centimeters, then you have RV enlargement as well. Or dilatation. So, by when you do your study, when you do your routine study, if you do these all the time, you will it, the, the measurements will stick, the numbers will stick. So you just have to practice doing that. All right. Now, other other measurements that we can do in the right ventricle is the right ventricle flow track. And this is very important. So in the parasternal long axis view, remember the first, the first uh, image here is the parasternal long axis view. This is the septum. This is the LV cavity. Posterior wall is there. This is the mitral valve. The anterior leaflet is there. The posterior leaflet, the left atrium. Descending aorta is right there. This is our aortic valve which closed because it's this is this is the beginning of diastole, so the aortic valve close. This is our right ventricular flow trap, the proximal dimension, proximal right ventricular flow trap, and we usually measure it as well. Okay. You can also get the proximal right ventricular flow track if you do your short axis at the level of the aorta, so remember this is the aorta, pulmonic valve is here, pulmonary trunk, this is our proximal right ventricular flow track, or tricuspid valve is someplace over there. So if you measure this dimension as well, that's your right ventricular flow track, proximal dimension. And for the distal right ventricular flow track dimension, it's measured right at the pulmonic valve. Okay? 
So you, it's, it's measured right down there. So this is the distal right ventral flow track dimension. So you, have, you should do your proximal and your distal. All right. So, so you should pra practice these as well. So you have to know where to get the proximal. Remember the proximal, the parsternal turn along, or the short axis, and then the distal, the, the um, short axis at the level of the aorta, but you want to go close to the pulmonic valve. So that's the distal right ventral flow tract dimension. All right, so in some important numbers, the distal right ventral flow tract is measured at end diastole. So you're going to do your measurements in end diastole, just like we do the left side, end diastole. And as, as mentioned, we, we'll do it in the partial or short at the insertion of the, um, this is the distal, at the insertion of the pulmonic valve. So that's the distal. So some of the dimensions, um, if the distal dimension is more than 2.7 centimeters, then it suggests right ventral flow tracker or RV dilatation. So the distal measurement is done right at the, the pulmonic valve, and if it's more than 2.7, it suggests right ventricular dilatation. And if the proximal measurement is more than 3.3, .3, then it suggests right ventricular dilatation. So when you're doing a study, you know, it's a quick measurement. So, you know, in your power, you, you, your power stern or long, measure your proximal RVOT dimension. Uh, when you do your short axis, then you can do both the, the uh, you can do both the proximal and the distal. Okay? Enlargement and dilatation can mean exactly the same thing. Well, you have to be careful. If you talk about mm -hmm. right ventricular hypertrophy, that means thickening of the muscle. Dil dilatation and enlargement we use interchangeable to mean uh, a, a, an increase in the size of the chamber, increased chamber size. Okay. But, but for the yes. track, yes. dilatation and enlargement. Same thing. So, and that's a very good question because now we, we're into RV1 thickness. So, if you see RVH, don't confuse RVH with um, dilatation. RVH is thickening. And you, the best view to uh, measure the, the right ventricle wall is the subcostal view. And you'll get that in the exam too. So the subcostal view is, uh, and you, you, you should zoom it so that the error in measurement will be less, okay? So you should try and zoom it so that the error will be less, okay? So you can see the first image there is a subcostal, and you can see the, the focus is right at this point and you zoom it so you can measure from the uh from the the from this point to this point okay so from the leading edge to the trailing edge and if anything above uh five millimeters is enlarged so anything above five millimeters is enlarged and I say you want to zoom it. And you can also do the measurements from M mode. We've been talking about M mode uh, quite a bit. So we we after after we do the right heart, then the next series of lectures will be uh, M mode. Let me just. Uh... All right, so the next series of lecture will be M mode, so you will see. But the subcostal view, identify the area, zoom it, and, and, and then do your measurements. Greater than five millimeters would be um, enlargement. Okay. 
So the RV wall thickness is measured in diastole, subcostal view, or the left parasternal view. So it's done again in diastole. Thickness greater than 0.5 centimeters or 5 millimeters suggests right ventricular hypertrophy. RV hypertrophy is seen in pulmonary hypertension, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and infiltrative disease such as amyloidosis. So anything that infiltrates the, the, the muscle, okay, such as, uh, you know, amyloid, there are multiple infiltrative diseases um, which can cause thickening. So when you see that, you know that that's not supposed to happen. So you have to find out what's going on. So it's important to do the measurements. Also, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there's a separate um, echo lecture on that as well. It's a condition where the heart muscle thickens. And it could, you know, it could be secondary to hypertension, aortic stenosis, or something like that, or it could be idiopathic. And we're gonna discuss those in a separate lecture. Pulmonary hypertension is big because that's one of the things that will give you right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, we had just touched on the septal defects. If you have any type of septal defect, you have increased blood flow from the left side to the right side, increased pulmonary blood flow, damage the pulmonary circuit, you have pulmonary hypertension, that pressure backs up into the right side of the heart and can cause thickening of the muscle. So that's one of the um, tip off that something is going on. So RVH. All right, so um, the RV is systolic function. So just like the left side, the right side of a systolic function, you should, it, as a matter of fact, it's very important that you know what the, the RV systolic function is doing. When we did the left side, we did ejection fraction. We did uh, we, we 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 look at the Doppler signal. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of different methods. We you know we, we look at strain and all those things to to, to determine the left the, the the function of the left side. No, we want to look at the function of the right side. Are do are we going to use the same thing? We have to modify it a little bit. So. Some of the disease that affect the right side will cause the, the right ventricular systolic function to be depressed, and you have to know those conditions. Um, pulmonary hypertension, we talk about that, it can affect and does affect the, um, the, the, the RV systolic function. And sometimes I'm a little bit reluctant to put a pulmonary artery systolic pressure on my report because it doesn't give you the full answer unless you look at the RV systolic function as well as that number that we give you because the combination is the most important thing, not any one of them. Um, so you can get um, right-sided uh, dysfunction from left-sided problem. So if the left heart is not pumping strong, so we have, say, a cardiomyopathy involving the left side, what's going to happen? You're going to, you know, the, the volume in the left atrium is going to be increased. It's going to put a, a pressure going into the pulmonary veins, flood the lungs, so you have shortness of breath, pulmonary edema. But the arterial pressure, will also go up, the pulmonary arterial pressure. And then that's gonna also affect the right side of the heart. So one of the most common cause for right-sided heart problem is left-sided heart problem. Because the, the whole thing backs, backs up. So if you have a problem with the left side, it can affect the right side. All right? Okay. Also valvular heart disease. Just take mitral regurgitation, for example. If the mitral valve is not functioning properly and there's backflow from the left ventricle to the left atrium, 
that's going to put pressure on the pulmonary venous system, flood the lungs. It's going to put pressure on the pulmonary arterial system and affect the right side. So, you know, problems in the left side usually affect the right side. So you have to be aware of that. All right. So when we assess in the right ventricular systolic function, that's how well the right ventricle is uh, pumping, so to speak. We can have what we call qualitative assessment. We can just look at it. So if we do an RV focus view, we can look at it and see what, if it, is it contracting well. Just like we do the left side, visually just look at it. Is it contracting very well? Yes or no? If you see enough of these, sometimes you can say, you know, is this a normal function or is it an abnormal function? It's not very, very accurate in, in some situations, but you can see. But the thing to do is quantitative assessment. You have to do quantitative evaluation, and they're going to test you on quantitative. They're not going to test you on qualitative. So some of the things that we can use for quantitative assessment of the RV systolic function is RIMP, which stands for Right Ventricular Index of Myocardial Performance. We'll go over that, okay? It, it, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. So RIMP. That's right ventricular index of myocardial perform, performance. So and we also use it on the left side. I'm not sure if we had discussed it for the left side, but we, it's, it's, it's basically him. It's index of myocardial performance. And you can do it on the left side and you can do it on the right side. Okay? For the right side, we use fractional area change, FAC, FAC, so 2D fractional area change, and we're going to go over each of these in details, in detail, so fractional area change, so it's just basically, you're going to get the area in diastole, and you're going to get the area in systole, and see the percentage change, so, you know, it's not really an ejection fraction, because it's not a volume assessment, it's an area assessment, okay? Um, very important because what we have found is that tissue Doppler imaging, looking at S prime, is probably one of the more accurate way of assessing RV systolic function. So the tissue Doppler imaging of the tricuspid lateral annular systolic velocity. So for an apical four-chamber view, and we're going to go over these in details, but the apical four-chamber view, like you're doing TAPSI, you're going to put the cursor, the lateral tricuspid annulus. When we do TAPSI, it's actually a longitudinal measurement, a displacement. So remember, displacement, the difference between distance and displacement is Displacement is a vector. Distance is a scalar quantity. Vectors have direction, so it moves, it's a longitudinal uh, uh, motion. And that's why we use the M mode to measure it. We just want to measure how much it goes up. Whereas when we do S prime with tissue Doppler, we use the velocity we're looking at. So if it's, a, if it's a normal muscle, it's supposed to move with a certain amount of velocity. If it's abnormal, then the velocity is going to be less. Same, you know, simple thing. And it's very, very accurate. Whereas TAPSE, T-A-P-S-E, is tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. Tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So how much it moves up, it's a displacement. How much it moves up in systole. And that is done, <coughs> apical four-chamber view, Cursor is across the lateral tricuspid annulus, and you use M mode. That's an M mode measurement. You just want to see how much it increases, how much it goes up in systole. And then longitudinal strain and strain rate. We haven't got discussed these yet, but strain is the percentage shortening 
when we're talking about the 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 the, the, the heart contracting, remember the, the the base of the heart moves up towards the apex, so it shortens. So it's basically strain is just the percentage shortening, and then strain rate is the rate of shortening, or the the, the rate of strain. Um, we'll discuss that uh, later. Um, now we're going to discuss him. And just follow me. It's not difficult. The definition for him, whether you're looking at the left side or the right side. And remember, him is the index of myocardial performance. Basically, how well the heart is performing. And it, it actually looks at both systolic and diastolic function. So it, it's not just a systolic function. It looks at both systolic and diastolic function. But the definition for uh, IMP is it's a time thing, okay? It's the time from your if we, we're we going to be using either the tricuspid or the mitral valve because you can have the him for the left side or the him for the right side. So if, we, if we're looking at the right side, then it is the time from the closure of the tricuspid valve to the opening of the tricuspid valve minus the ejection period divided by the ejection period okay so 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 him index of myocardial performance and if we use the so this so if we look at this, this is your track house with inflow, right? E velocity, A velocity. Or the left side, the same thing. So the 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 uh, the track house with valve opens here, right? And it closes right there, right? So it is the time from the track house with valve closure. So the track house with valve closure. and the tricuspid valve opens there. So it is a time from the tricuspid valve closure to the tricuspid valve opening. So you just gotta measure the time. You're gonna subtract from that the ejection period. So, the, so you remember on the right side, you have ejection across the pulmonic valve. Well, it's going to take a little time to eject the blood across that pulmonic valve, which depends on how well the right side is functioning. So you're going to take your tricuspid valve closure to the tricuspid valve opening, get that time. You're going to subtract from that the ejection time, okay? And then you're going to divide that by the ejection time. That's also called the tie index. It's either imp, tie index, whichever one you want to use. Any problem with that definition? I'm from the closure of the tricuspid valve to the opening of the tricuspid valve. Yeah, let's measure that time. Minus mm -hmm. the ejection period. Right. Divided by, by mm -hmm. ejection time. This ejection period and time period is same. Okay. Period and time is same. So, and that's the definition for the right side and the left side. The only problem, though, is on the, if you remember, on the right side, when we do tricuspid inflow, we get, uh, you know, tricuspid closure, the E and the A. We get our in, tricuspid inflow, E and A. Then the valve close, and then we get our tricuspid valve opening in the A, then it close. 
The ejection period, you have to get that from the pulmonary, across the pulmonary valve. So you have to put your cursor now across the pulmonary valve and, and, and get your Doppler signal. So this is done usually with a PW. Okay? Just so you normally do your, oh, okay. Just the normal uh, yeah. uh, pulmonic flow. You put your Doppler right at the, if you want to call it, the tip of the pulmonic leaflet and you get your ejection. So the definition of imp, if we were on the right side, is tricuspid, the time from tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening minus the ejection time. So you you it's two different images you're gonna you're gonna use. You're gonna you're gonna put your do, your Doppler across the tricuspid valve, and you're gonna get the, the, the time from the tricuspid valve closure to tricuspid valve opening, and then you're gonna put your cursor now across the pulmonic valve, and you're gonna get the ejection across the the, 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 the pulmonic valve. That's the ejection uh, period. Of time. Yeah. PW. PW, so always PW. So if you're going to do it on the right, it's on the, on the left side, the beauty of the left side, one image. You can use one image. So if you put your, um, your cursor anywhere between, or not anywhere, usually midway between the aortic valve and the tracker and the mitral valve, preferable in a five chamber view fashion. You will get your E and your A, then you'll get your IVCT, and you get your ejection across the aortic valve, you get your IVRT, and your E and your A. So you get everything in one image on the left side. On the right side, you have to use two images. Where do you put your cursor next to the check cluster? The, 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 my, my valve to get to get the EPC right to get the what? Ejection. The ejection period. You you put the right to the the the, the, the right valve. Yeah, right. that's fine. Oh, you normally do your um your flow across the uh, pulmonic valve same way. Your cell type and stuff. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Same. 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 Same image. So are they? Are both images done with PW or just everything, yeah, No, everything is done PW. It's the PW measurement. But if if you were if you pay very close attention, you'll see that the tricuspid valve closure, the time from the tricuspid valve closure. So the tricuspid valve opening minus the ejection period or ejection time is actually IVC, IVCT plus IVRT. So it's the isovolumic contraction time plus isovolumic relaxation time. So if you want to write it another way, IMP is IVCT plus IVRT divided by the ejection period of time. If you look carefully, okay, so, all right, look, follow me right here. So this is, this is our tricuspid valve opening with your E and your A velocity, right? Tricuspid valve closures right there. Tricuspid valve opening is there. And we're going to subtract from it this ejection time. This first portion of, this is actually our IVCT. From right there to there is IVCT. And from this point to there is IVRT. So it's actually IVCT plus IVRT divided by the ejection uh, period or ejection time. Plus nothing. When you say IVCT plus IVRT. Yeah, IVRT, yeah. Divided by the ejection. Yeah. 
equals m. Yes. All right. So, so the assessment of R V systolic function, RIMP, because we are on the right side, so it's RIMP. On the left side is LIMP. Okay, so with a systolic dysfunction, you tend to get prolongation of the IVCT and shortening of the ejection uh, time or period. So the RIMP increases. So with systolic dysfunction, RIMP increases. And if it's above 0.4, it's abnormal. You, you, you have RV. Uh, systolic dysfunction. So RIMP greater than 0.4 suggests RV systolic dysfunction. IVCT, isovolumic contraction time, IVRT, isovolumic relaxation time, and ease ejection time. Ejection time. Okay. We can also do RIMP using tissue up. And I'm probably going to come back to that. But you can also use tissue Doppler. Tissue Doppler is more accurate because you use just one image. As opposed, when, we, when we're using um, the, the pulse wave Doppler, we do the triphosphate inflow and then the flow across the pulmonic valve. So we use two images. And, you know, they might not represent the same frame. You should always try to get them in the same frame. It's difficult. But um, tissue Doppler, we can do it with tissue Doppler. We'll, we'll get back to that. All right. So the next assessment of RV systolic function is the fractional area change. And we say that it's, it's, it's like a knockoff ejection fraction. It's a volume change. That's why they call fractional area change. So it's not an ejection fraction. It's not a volume. So it's the RV in diastole, you're going to get that. You're going to plane the borders. You're going to get the area. You're going to subtract from that the end systolic area. So when it contracts, you plane the border, you get the area, and you're going to divide it by the um, end diastolic area. So it's, it's a knockoff ejection fraction. So that's a fractional area change. Uh, you're going to trace the RV endocardial border, apical four-chamber view, RV focus. Remember, RV focus. Systole and diastole. And you get RV systolic dysfunction if the fractional area change is less than 35%. Yeah, it's like, is almost like the Simpsons yeah, almost like that, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, it's an area. This is an area. All right? So that's our fractional area change, and it's done like this. So remember, you get your, your RV focus view where you can see the RV very well. So in diastole, you trace the border. Your computer will give you the area. And then in systole, in systole you do the same thing. This fractional area change is 60%. So the normal is about 35%. So it's normal, right? This one, the second one, you do the same thing in diastole. You trace the area. In systole, you trace the area. Remember, it's diastolic area minus systolic area divided by diastolic area. So it's 40%, still above 35%, so it's normal, as opposed to the last one, this one, where this is our end diastolic area, we trace, end systolic area, and we subtract it, and 20%. So it's less than 35%, okay? Any question on fractional area change? Then you get to the point you're getting more than that. Yeah, you're getting close. So you, you know, that's a patient you probably want to follow up a little bit. 
you know, more frequent. All right, so. So 60% is addressing the part that isn't changed. It's there. It's there. A large part over a smaller part. So we're dealing with 60% represents the, the, the area that changed. So it's, it's, it's so 60% less than in diastole. No, it's just a change in area. Right. So it, it's a large change in area. That's all it means. It's a large change in area. So the area is less by 60%? No. It's, well, when you say well, it's less in systole. Correct. I mean, yeah, it's less in systole. Systole versus diastole. Yeah. Because so you want more area change, that suggests a normal functioning. So it's 60% less in systole than diastole. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. I did not hear his question. No, he was just saying, is it 60% less? Whereas, you know, it's 60% change. Um, so it's 60% less in, 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 you know, you can look at it 60% less in systole or 60% more in diastole. Oh, okay, but right. I, have a, I have a... Okay. Um, can we do a volumetric computation for it's not, very it's not very accurate because of the trabeculation and the geometry of the right ventricle. That is why we don't do a volumetric assessment. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. Um, so these are just going over some of some of the things that we use. Tapsy. Um, so you should know each one of these things. The the tapsy. So it's the tricuspid and the plane systolic excursion. How much that tricuspid plane moves up in systole. You, it's supposed to move up more than 15 millimeters. So a normal tapsy is greater than 15 millimeters. And that's going to be an every exam. <laughs> All right. Um, and we'll show you how to do that. Um, the, the other thing is your, um, your pulse Doppler velocity. Um, that's when you, instead of, instead of using, instead of, instead of using the, um, the, the, the M mode, you're going to use your, your uh, TDI. So it's a pulse wave Doppler, TDI is a pulse wave, and it's the velocity. So it's not a distance. And we use a cutoff of uh, 10 centimeters per second. Okay, so anything less than 10 centimeters per second suggests RV systolic dysfunction. What? For the, using the velocity. Velocity, not topsy. Topsy is a longitudinal, it's a displacement. Whereas when we talk about the RV systolic velocity, it's a velocity. Okay? TDI. All right, let's see. All right, so TAPSI, we're going to go over TAPSI in a little bit more detail. So you, you have to remember what the acronym stands for, tricuspid, tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. You measure the distance of the systolic excursion of the RV annular segment along its longitudinal plane. Remember, in systole, it moves up, that's it moves down. All right, you're going to use the apical four-chamber view. Um, place the cursor at the lateral annulus, and you want to click on your M mode button, because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distance that we're measuring. Dr. Smith, excuse Yes. Uh, um, to go uh, back, I'd like to go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. What is that? I would like you to go over. Like to go over. Uh, you're, 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 you're losing at the end of your question. Huh? Huh? I, I lost your... 
Sorry? Sorry? I, I'm not getting the end of your question. Okay. okay. I said I, said, I, would, I would go over something. something. Go over what? He wants you to go over something, but he didn't say what he wants you to go over. Something for me. For me. What I'm is that? Saying, I'm saying we can, we can increase your doctor image. You said anything you said less anything less Anything less than 10 centimeters per second is abnormal. Yes. In, in, um, in, in, what would uh, that be? Um, S prime. S prime. It, it's S -prime. a systolic S -prime. excursion. So systolic excursion is S prime. S -prime. Systolic okay. excursion. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so syst when we talk about systole, it's S prime. When we talk about diastole, it's either E prime or A prime. So if we say systolic excursion, we mean S prime. So it's a RVS prime. RVS prime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so you're going to use your apical four chamber view. You place your cursor at the lateral annulus, and it's the M mode button you're going to press because you want a distance. You don't want a velocity. So you're not going to press TDI or pulse rate. And it's normal, RV systolic function is normal if the excursion is greater than 15 millimeters. Anything less than 16 millimeters is abnormal. Okay, any question there? And this is how it's done. Okay, so your apical four chamber view, okay, everybody can see this. This is your left ventricle. Mitral valve, left atrium. It's a little five chamber view. Uh, you want to focus more on the RV, so it's an RV focus view. This is the cursor, and you want to put the cursor right at the tri the, the, the tricuspid annulus, the lateral tricuspid annulus, the M mode button, and this is what you get in the M mode picture. So it's flat here, and then in systole, the annulus moves up. So this excursion from the baseline up to the, the maximum point in systole, that's what you're measuring. That's your TAPSI. It should be more than 15 millimeters. M mode. One more. One more. If you have, a, if, yeah. What's the question? Um. So are you um, saying so are you for the view can be used for what? For this measurement. For five chamber views. Okay. Or for it's, or which is it? Which is it? It's an RV focus view. Okay. It's an so RV so. RV focus view. So when you when you evaluate in the the right side, it should be an RV focus view. And it will look like a five chamber view in some in some instance. Okay. Okay. You want to make sure you can see the apex of the RV. You want to make sure you can see the apex of the RV. Because remember you have to measure also that longitudinal dimension. Okay. Any question about TAPSI? Because it should be a routine. It should be a routine part of your study. Some people also use RVS prime as a routine part of the study. But if you if you use any one, that's fine. If the RV is abnormal, say you do a TAPSI and it comes out to 10 millimeters, you probably should do a S prime, RVS prime. Okay? All right. So we do M mode, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, so as we said, they, they, we can use the tissue Doppler derived S prime. This is a velocity. It's a P double measurement. Anything to do with tissue Doppler imaging, it's pulse wave. So again, apical four chamber view RV focus. The sample, the Doppler sample is placed at the lateral tricuspid annulus. 
just like we're doing a topsy. The S prime velocity is the highest systolic velocity. And S prime velocity less than 10 centimeters per second in the case of the systolic dysfunction. Very accurate. When we do nuclear study, nuclear study is one of the best methods to evaluate RV function, bar none. So nuclear study. When we correlate S prime with uh, nuclear study, it's it, it's S prime is very very accurate. It predicts RV systolic function very well. So all right. So so you know what you do. So this is this is your four chamber view, right? On top is your two D image, two dimensional image four chamber view or RV focus view. The lateral, see so your cursor is right at the lateral track off with annulus. And then you just press your TDI button. You get a systolic excursion. You get a E prime in diastole and an A prime also in diastole. Just like you get on the, 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 the left side. Just like you get on the left side. You're going to measure that systolic peak systolic uh, velocity. If it's less than 10 centimeters per second, it's abnormal. Okay? This is just using um, another method. We use strain. We can do it with strain. Uh, the same thing, you know, you see a four-chamber view, and your cursor is right there, lateral, annulus. Uh, this is your systolic and your diastolic. And you can you can map if you gate it to uh, on the EKG, systole is from there to there, so you can from 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 the uh, QRS to the T wave, so it's a systolic excursion. And in diastole you have your E prime and your A prime, just like the left side. Okay, tissue Doppler imaging. All right, so. Um, so those are the methods we use to evaluate RV systolic function. A routine echo should always include one or two methods of evaluating RV systolic function. TAPSI or S prime. If, uh, if it's abnormal and you want to use IMP, or you want to use fractional area change, then you can do that. But it, a routine echo should have at least one or two methods of evaluating RV systolic function. So we, 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 we look at um, visual, uh, qualitative assessment, just visualizing it. Not very accurate, but you can visualize it. Uh, we look at uh, fractional area change, show you how to do that. We look at HIMP index of myocardial uh, performance, also known as the TIE index, show you how to do that. Um, look at TAPSI, and we look at the uh, RV uh, systolic um, uh, excursion. Um, probably the most accurate method though is uh, 3D RV volume assessment but so that's outside of nuclear study if you're talking about echo the three-dimensional echo looking at um, all right so we're going to take a little bit of uh, a little break and then we're going to come back to right atrium um, but you have to be familiar with uh, the, the the RV assessment, methods of evaluating RV assessment. Remember RV focus view, okay? So it's not your common garden, apical four chamber view. You're gonna manipulate the probe to get more of the RV. So let's take a, 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 a 10 minute break and then we'll do right atrium. 
Any question in between? All right, so let's take a, a little break. So we're going to continue. <clears throat> so the, the right ventricle is important. The right atrium is very, very important as well. So the right atrium has a number of functions. One of the functions uh, the right atrium has is assisting in filling the, uh, the right ventricle, just like the left atrium. Remember that when the atrium contracts, we get that a velocity. The right atrium does the same. So it assists in filling the right ventricle. Um, you can you can you can plane or you can you can get the area of the right atrium in the apical four chamber view. So you get your apical four chamber view and you just plane the right atrium. Uh, planimetry. Normal right atrial area should be less than 18 centimeters squared. So these numbers you just have to know. Okay, and this is how it's done. So <clears throat> your apical uh, four chamber view, you have you have your mate, so this is the annulus, right? tricuspid annulus and you make you drop a line from the, the, the medial annulus to the lateral annulus and then you just trace the border of the right atrium. This is our major axis and our minor axis. Okay? And the computer will give you the area. Remember the uh, the area should be less than 18 centimeters squared. And the, the minor axis should be less than 4.4 centimeter. And the major axis should be less than 5.3. So, <clears throat> so this green line, so the distance from the annulus, so mid annulus down to the base, that's the major axis that should be less than 5.3 and the the minor axis should be less than 4.4 centimeters. So you can you can measure the area of the right atrium and you can measure the dimension the long axis sorry the major axis and the minor axis. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> hemodynamic assessment of the right heart and pulmonary uh, circulation. So, when we talk about the right ventricular systolic pressure, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, and the right atrial pressure, those are all hemodynamic measurements of the right heart. So, you can measure the right atrial pressure because if there's too much pressure in the right atrium you know, that suggests that there's a, 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 a problem if the pressure in the right ventricle is elevated that also suggests that there's a problem and if the pulmonary pressures are elevated it suggests that there's problems as well so this is the current method because there are a bunch of different methods but this is the current method that we are using to assess right atrial and right ventricular right, uh, and uh, pulmonary artery pressures. Um, we look at the IVC, the inferior vena cable. So you, you have to be able to identify the, the inferior vena cable. If you look at a normal patient, that inferior vena cable collapses and it dilates, collapses. Dilate. That's a normal respiratory variation in the inferior vena cable. It collapses within inspiration and it dilates in expiration. So you have what we call an inspiratory collapse. 
and that's normal. It's supposed to collapse almost to obliteration in inspiration and then in expiration it dilates. So someone with normal pressures on the right side will have normal collapse of collapsibility of the IVC, inferior vena cava, with inspiration. Okay? Um, so most commonly estimated by utilizing the inferior vena cava diameter from the subcostal view and the presence of inspiratory collapse. So it's a subcostal view. You identify your IVC and you're going to do your measurement just before the hepatic vein, proximal to the hepatic vein. So see where the hepatic vein comes into the IVC. And then just before that, you're going to do your measurement. You're going to do your measurement in, uh, in expiration. We say held expiration. So now you're going to do your measurement in uh, inspiration. The, 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 the normal collapsibility should be more than 50%. Okay? So the measurement of the IVC should be made at the end of expiration. And then uh, remember, just proximal to the junction of the hepatic vein. So you're going to measure it. Uh, when you do your, you're going to measure it in both. But, but to get the, 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 the diameter, you're going to, that's in, in expiration. That's uh, end expiration. And it should be less than 2.1 centimeter. Okay? That's the end of the expiration. Yes, yes. Just proximal to the hepatic vein. Okay? End expiration. It should be less than 2.1. If it's dilated, it suggests disease. Okay? If it's not collapsing, if it's not collapsing with um, inspiration, more than 50%, it also suggests disease or elevated pressures, okay? And you can let the patient do what we call a sniff test. So sniff, so it's a, a sort of force um, expiration, um, sorry, it's a force inspiration, and you can see the collapsibility. So the sniff, okay, force uh, inspiration, and see the collapsibility. So you can do that during your study, and it should be a routine part of your study as well. Question. Question. More than 50%. Yes. Um, is this yes. kind of diastolosis? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The variation is not with diastole or systole, but it, it, it's okay. with um, okay. inspiration. Inspiration. And expiration. Okay. Respiration. Okay. It's a respiratory okay. thing. It's not okay. a diastolic or systolic thing. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So, so this is what it looks like. So this is our subcostal view. This is our IVC. The hepatic vein is right there. So you do it just proximal to the hepatic vein. Okay. And remember, end expiration Okay. And it's supposed to be a routine part of all your exams. All your echo exams supposed to you're supposed to do the measurement. So you do the measurement in end expiration and you want to see the inspiratory collapse. And you can do the sniff test. Let them you can do it uh, you can you can do it by eyeballing but you can just freeze it with uh, force inspiration inspiration freeze it and then just measure it but a normal individual you see almost completely collapse mm -hmm. so you can you know visualization all right um how do we use this to determine 
the right atrial pressure. So we use the IVC and the variation of the IVC to determine right atrial pressure. This is the standard today, so you have to know that. If it's collapsing more than 50% in inspiration, and it's less than 2.1 centimeters, then the right atrial pressure is approximately 3 millimeters mercury. So it's normal. If it's dilated to more than 2.1 centimeters, and the inspiratory collapse is less than 50%, it's approximately 15 millimeters mercury. Anything that falls outside of that, 8 millimeters mercury. What was the last thing? First thing was 3 millimeters mercury. The first thing is normal. 3 millimeters mercury. Okay. So normal is if it's less than 2.1 centimeters, more than 50% inspiratory collapse. So that's a normal pressure in the right atrium. If it's more than 2.1 and the inspiratory collapse is less than 50%, then that right atrial pressure is approximately 15 millimeters mercury or more. Anything that falls outside of that, then it's 8 millimeters, 8 millimeters mercury. Okay? So, so the normal, if the IVC, if the IVC is less than 2.1 or equal to 2.1, with greater than 50% collapse with the sniff test, then I say it's normal approximately 3 and the range is from 0 to 5. If it's greater, if the IVC is greater than 2.1 and less than 50% collapse, then the right atrial pressure is approximately 15, okay? <clears throat> and anything that falls in between is approximately 8, and the range is 5 to 10. So don't confuse yourself. Simple way of assessing the right atrial pressure, because you're going to have to assess the right atrial pressure in your patients. And of course, it's a, it, it's a testable thing, so that it's going to be on your exam. All you need to do is look at the IVC measurement. If it's less than 2.1 centimeters, more than 50% collapse within inspiration or with the sniff test, it's normal. 3 millimeters mercury, range 0 to 5. If it's 2.1 centimeters, or less than 50% inspiratory collapse, 15. Anything falls outside that range is 8 millimeters mercury. Any question? Dr. Smith? Dr. Smith? Yes. Uh, um, uh, should we should we that, should we that at this point, at this um, point those numbers are actually put it in square. Formula. What's that? At this point, should we share that number? I added to the four V square. No, we don't get there yet. We just we do, we're not there. We just just assessment of the right atrial pressure. This is just assessment of the right atrial pressure. We're not there as yet. So just to assess the right atrial pressure. All you need is the IVC diameter and whether it collapse normal in inspiration, yes or no. If it collapse normal, the right atrial pressure is 3. If it collapse abnormal, that's less than 50%, then it's 15. Anything that falls outside of that is 8. So you don't have to know what the intermediate, you don't have to study all that. Anything, if it falls outside of those two limits, 
it's eight. Right atrial pressure. When we did the when 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 I said the exam, I didn't let you assess right atrial pressure. We gave it to you because at that point you didn't know how to assess it. Okay. Now the next thing is how do you and we did this before. How how to assess pulmonary artery and right ventricular systolic pressure. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. So, so how how to assess how to assess the pulmonary artery systolic pressure and right ventricular systolic pressure? Remember, we went over this before in our hemodynamic session. We went over this. Okay. So, the gradient across the tricuspid valve is the right ventricular systolic pressure minus the right atrial pressure and that's a gradient there has to be a pressure difference for blood to flow from one area to the next so the right ventricular systolic pressure is equal to the gradient plus right atrial pressure showed you how to get the gradient just looking at the tr velocity and now i've shown you how to get the right atrial pressure so it should be a it should be a routine part of your exam to put the right ventricular systolic pressure and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure right okay so the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is the same thing as the right ventricular systolic pressure unless there is obstruction at the right ventricular flow tract so now you're experts in getting <laughs> right ventricular systolic pressure and pulmonary artery pressure. Yeah, because I mean this was the only part that was missing. Now we give you the final piece of the puzzle. So TR regurg uh, regurgitant Doppler signal represents the systolic pressure difference between the right ventricle and the right atrium, right? And as you say, you just have the right atrial pressure to the gradient and you get the RV systolic pressure. The pulmonary artery systolic pressure is the same thing as the RV systolic pressure unless there is obstruction. Okay. So, you know, all of this we have done before. Now, you know, hemodynamic session. So the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, you need multiple, multiple windows should be, you should multiple windows. Right? Because remember, you want to get that right. You want to get your beam as parallel to flow as possible. And you cannot just assume that any, your apical 4 or your RV inflow view will give you. You cannot just assume that. Majority of the time, however, the RV inflow view will give you a parallel beam to, to, to flow. So, but it's not always the case. You know, each individual anatomy differs. So you have to multiple windows. And uh, you're going to look at your right ventricular flow track, um, your, the apical four chamber view, and your tricuspid inflow view. So those are all the, the areas that you're going to look at. Right? So again, you put your cursor, this is your short axis at the level of the, uh, the tricuspid valve. You put your Doppler signal across the tricuspid valve. C double, of course, because you're measuring large velocity, large gradient. So this is your TR, it's a systolic envelope. And the gradient is 4V squared, right? Using the modified Bernoulli equation, you just measure your velocity. Here the velocity is 2.89. So 4V squared is 33.5, so the gradient. So all you need to add to that to get your right ventricular systolic pressure is the right atrial pressure. And by measuring the IVC, observing collapsibility with inspiration, you can determine the right atrial pressure. And 
can get your RV systolic pressure and your pulmonary artery systolic pressure. All right. So you and we go, so these things we went over we did before in hemodynamics. So to get the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure now, you get your PI, remember that? You get your PI, and you want the, the end diastolic velocity. So the, the, the gradient, remember blood is flowing from the pulmonary trunk across the pulmonary valve into the right ventricle flow track in PI. So the pressure in the pulmonary trunk must be greater than the pressure in the right ventricle flow track in diastole, at the end of diastole. So the 4V squared, which is the end diastolic velocity, that's the gradient. So to get that end diastolic uh, pressure, you're going to have you're going to have the the uh, the right atrial pressure to the gradient, right? So it's four v squared plus gravity. Yes. <laughs> okay. So all you have to do is had you're going to have the uh, the right atrial pressure, and I've shown you how to get the right atrial pressure. 2.1 is the magic number. If it's less than 2.1 and collapsibility is more than 50% in inspiration, normal. So it's 3 millimeters mercury. If it's more than 2.1 and it's less than 50% collapsibility, 15 approximately. Anything that falls in between is 8. All right? All right, so this is our pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. So this is your PI signal. It's a diastolic phenomenon, okay? So this is what it looks like. It occurs from the end of the T wave to the beginning of the QRS. In diastole, this is the velocity you want, the end diastolic velocity, 4V squared plus the right atrial pressure, okay? End diastolic velocity. That's our early pulmonic regurgitation uh, velocity. Okay, so four v squared plus the right atrial pressure. Any question there? Okay. So that's it for right for the right atrium. So we we the, the right atrium it has it has function. So it it, it acts as a reservoir. So it has a reservoir function because it stores blood, right? And it acts as a conduit to allow blood to flow from the IVC, the SVC, into the right ventricle. It acts as a conduit and then it has a pumping function because it contracts. So those are the functions of the right atrium. But in measuring pressures, we need to know the pressure in the right atrium. And I've shown you how to do that. All right. Now the tricuspid valve. Okay, all right, so the mean, okay, all right, so the mean, the mean pulmonary artery pressure, if you want, there's a lot of calculation, we want you to evaluate the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And what, what you need to do is get the proximal velocity. So, to get the end diastolic, the pulmonary artery end diastolic pressure, 
um, we showed you that you need to get use the end diastolic velocity, okay? To get the mean pulmonary artery pressure, you're going to use this velocity, the early pulmonary regurgitation velocity. So same 4V squared plus right to pressure, but you're going to use the proximal velocity. Okay, so a lot of definitions will will use the um, the mean pressure as opposed to the end diastolic pressure. So if you read any textbook on, on cardiovascular medicine, they're going to mention the, the pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean pulmonary pressure greater than 25 millimeters mercury. So they're not going to give you systolic and diastolic. They give you a mean. So one way of getting the mean PA pressure is using the early RV, uh, the regurgitant velocity, 4V squared plus right atrial pressure. You can also use your, your pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic pressure to get it. So the mean our pressure is equal to one-third the pulmonary artery systolic pressure plus two-third the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure. So the mean pulmonary artery systolic pressure for V squared plus right atrial pressure, but there's a proximal velocity as opposed to the um, so remember, this is the proximal velocity, right? That's the velocity you're going to use. And then you can also use, you already get, you already, uh, get your pulmonary artery systolic pressure and your pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. So the mean PA pressure would be one-third the systolic plus two-thirds of diastolic. Any question about that? All right, so, so what about the tricuspid valve? So, so the tricuspid valve is situated between the right atrium and the right ventricle. It consists of three leaflets, the anterior, posterior, and septal, and you're definitely going to get the RV inflow view, and they're going to ask you to label the tricuspid valve. Okay? The peak velocities across the tricuspid valve in diastole usually is less than 0.7 meters per second with slight respiratory variation. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to set an exam question and ask you to distinguish if this is the tricuspid inflow or the mitral inflow, what they will do in a question like that is to give you the E and the A, but show significant respiratory variation, and also give you lower velocities. Across the tricuspid valve, the velocity is going to be lower, and you'll have more respiratory variation. That would distinguish the, valve. the tricuspid or the right-sided valve from the left-sided valve. Right-sided valve tend to have much more respiratory variation. So that's one way of right-sided right valves. More respiratory. more respiratory variation. So it would similarly, if you have a tricuspid regurgitation and a mitral regurgitation, one the, the, the you know, the tricuspid regurgitation velocity is going to be less, and you'll have more respiratory variation. I've seen that in exam. So. Velocity less, right side, regurgitation, and left side. Uh, could you repeat that? Could you repeat that? On the right side, on the right side, the, the velocities are less on the right side, and you have more respiratory variation. So that's one of the method or means of distinguishing 
if if it's RV inflow, uh, sorry, tricuspid inflow or mitral inflow, or even tricuspid regurge from mitral regurge. All right, so let's move on. The tricuspid complex consists of the coordinate tendine, of course, attached to the papillary muscles and the fibrous uh, annula. So it's pretty similar to the to the mitral valve, but it has three leaflets. Um, diseases affecting the um, tricuspid valve, tricuspid stenosis, so it's not open and fully. Just like the mitral valve, you can have tricuspid stenosis. Rheumatic fever can also affect the tricuspid valve. It doesn't, rear, it doesn't commonly affect the right-sided valve, but if, it, if it's going to affect the right-sided valve, the tricuspid valve is the most common. Rarely the pulmonary valve. Carcinoid syndrome. Now, carcinoid syndrome is a very unique condition and it usually pops up in all exams. It is a, a malignant tumor, usually in the gastrointestinal tract. So it's a, it's a cancer. And basically, they, they, it produces certain compounds that when travel to the right side of the heart, or when travel to the heart, it tends to affect the valves. So carcinoid syndrome will show up mostly uh, in the right-sided valves. And it affects the valves in such a way that the valves look as if they are frozen. So it's usually a malignant, a cancer, cancerous condition in the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract, produce compounds or substances that affect the right side. And it can affect the left side, but mainly the right side and the tricuspid valve or the pulmonary valve. So you can get tumors on the tricuspid valve, benign tumor or cancer or cancerous tumors. Vegetation, which is infected material, can also um, inhabit the valve. And you can get valvular damage from the pacemaker. When we put a pacemaker in, the lead of the pacemaker, which is the wire that goes into the right ventricle, so it's the, the wire goes into the right ventricle, so it has to pass the right atrium across the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricular chamber and it can compress the, the, the leaflet, the, the tricuspid valve. And if, if there's not enough play in that um, wire or lead, you can sort of force the valve open and damage the valve. Also, aneurysm of valve salvo. Um, remember the, if you remember, the anatomy, the valve salva is almost right where you have the tricuspid valve. So if there is an aneurysm, dilatation of the, the valve salva can affect the um, tricuspid valve. Prosthetic obstruction, so you can have a um, prosthetic valve which is obstructed in the tricuspid uh, brain. All right, so, so let's look at tricuspid stenosis. Not as common as mitral stenosis, but uh, you can get it as well. And of course, it's probably going to be rheumatic. It's probably going to be rheumatic. Um, so the signs and symptoms of tricuspid regurgitation, we talk about a fluttering discomfort in the neck. And that's just because the blood cannot get out of the right atrium. So it backs up into the superior vena cava, and so you, the veins in the neck are going to be prominent, and you see flutter and discomfort in the neck. Fatigue, because there's decreased output from the right side of the heart. 
So patient gonna be fatigued. Pulls skin, okay, decrease output as well. Right upper quadrant abdominal discomfort. And that is because the blood cannot get out of the right atrium. So you're gonna be it's backed up into the IVC. So the liver becomes enlarged. So what, when you get that discomfort, it's the liver being enlarged and it's tender, painful. Okay. Jugular palpitation for the same reason. Blood cannot get out of the right atrium. So it backs up into the uh, superior vena cava. And you get what we call a pre-systolic murmur or the left sternal border, uh, the fourth interspace. And it increased with inspiration. Okay. So the tricuspid valve is supposed to open in diastole, but it's not opening fully. So in diastole, when you listen, you're going to get this murmur in diastole. So it's a diastolic murmur. So it's pre systolic. So, it, you know, it so it's a diastolic murmur you get. Um, Usually, on the right side, with inspiration, you get increased blood flow on the right side of the heart in inspiration. So any murmur on the right side is going to be increased with inspiration because of increased blood flow. On the left side, it's the opposite. You get increased blood flow on the left side with expiration. So all the murmurs on the left side is going to be increased in expiration. Okay. All right. So this is our apical four, and it's a sort of right ventricular focus view. And this is diastole because the, track, the mitral valve is closed, right? The tricuspid valve is still open. So it's stenotic and sort of, so it probably in, 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 in systole, it, it's probably not even going to close much more than that. So it's sort of probably fixed. So that's a tricuspid. That's one of the tip of that you might have stenosis. Because if you look on the, the, the left side, the mitral valve is closed. And then when you do the Doppler across the mitral valve, you get this Doppler signal. Okay? And you have to plane it. You have to get the gradient. The gradient is key. All right? So just like the right, the, the left side, you're going to do the same thing. And you're going to do it in multiple views. This is more right-sided focus, okay? And you can see this patient also have tricuspid regurg, okay? So in systole, you have the tricuspid regurg. And then in diastole, you can see you have this. It's, you don't get your nice E and your A, right? So that's also a tip-off. And then when you measure the gradient, the gradient is going to be elevated. So these are the, uh, the findings that indicate significant tricuspid um, stenosis. Okay? So the mean gradient greater than 5 or equal to 5, greater than or equal to 5 millimeters mercury suggests significant tricuspid regurgitation. Remember, with the mitral, it's greater than 10. You know, everything is lower on the right side. So greater than or equal to 5 millimeters mercury suggests significant tricuspid stenosis. And the pressure half time, um, in, in, with the mitral value is 220, with the tricuspid value is 190. And the valve area, if it's less than or equal to one centimeter squared, it suggests significant tricuspid stenosis. And then the mean gradient, 
no, not sorry. They they uh, inflow. Uh, that's your your t uh, TVI. That's your TVI. So your um, so you're gonna plane it, and it will give you a velocity time integral. So if it's if it's um, greater than sixty centimeters, that also is suggested. All right, um, and then supporting findings is enlarge atrium because if if the uh, tricuspid stenosis is significant, you can't get blood out of the right atrium, so it's going to get enlarged. So when remember we're going to do the area when you trace the area, if that's greater than eighteen centimeters squared, it's enlarged. So an enlarged uh, right atrium is also suggested and dilated if you're in a cable because increased pressure. Blood cannot get out of right atrium to increase pressure. So we're going to stop at uh, track hospice stenosis. And then the next, we will do, this is track hospice regurgitation. So I think that's enough for today. I'm not sure if we can finish this by the next session, but we might have two more sessions to finish right heart. But right heart is very, very important, so we're not going to rush it. Okay? One question, going back to, to the increase, if I got this right, increase with inspiration, right side. Yeah, all right-sided murmur will be increased with inspiration. So, tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid stenosis, pulmonic insufficiency. Right all right-sided murmurs. So either across the pulmonic valve or across the tricuspid valve, they're going to increase in inspiration. So the left side. Expiration. Increase with expiration. Yeah. And that's just because there's increased blood flow with uh, expiration. Any question? All right, so um, we'll meet in uh, two weeks, and uh, we go, we'll start our track hospital regurgitation, and uh, CO4, we can go. But I think we, realistically, we have two more sessions. All right, so we'll sign off here.